confession to make. I'm stubborn. Sometimes I refuse to change my mind just because, well, no one really likes to change their mind. And we especially don't appreciate it when someone tries to change our mind for us. In my case, I learned this fact about myself in kind of an embarrassing way. About eight years ago, I met the man I would eventually marry. Early in our relationship, he asked me to go to the ballet. Well, I panicked. I hate the ballet. I hated the ballet ever since I was four years old and I was forced to take ballet lessons. One day, I came home, put my four-year-old foot down and announced to my family, I quit. Not only did I refuse to take any more ballet lessons, I pretty much refused to go to the ballet again, ever. Except for that time I got dragged to the Nutcracker. The truth is, I had good reason for my dislike of the ballet. All that childhood drama. Besides, nobody in my family liked it, and I'd spent years telling people that I didn't like it either. So that's why I had a minor crisis when this guy I really liked asked me to go to the ballet. I did not want to say no, but somehow not liking the ballet had become an important part of my identity without my even realizing it. The truth is, when I thought about it, I hadn't been to the ballet since I was five. On the other hand, what if someone saw me there? Someone who knew I'd taken a principled anti-ballet position. <laughs> and then an even scarier thought hit me. What if I actually enjoyed it? What if I were forced to change my mind? Years later, this experience came in handy when I was trying to understand why people sometimes insist on ideas that are not consistent with medical evidence. I think, isn't it obvious that the data say X and they're saying Y? What's the big deal? Why can't they just change their minds? And then it hit me. If it was that painful for me to even consider changing my mind about the ballet, maybe it wasn't so hard to understand why someone would hold on to a belief they'd held for years, especially if that belief had helped them make important health decisions, and if it even had come to define their identities. When I thought about it that way, suddenly everything that seemed hopelessly irrational to me suddenly made a lot more sense. When we think about this issue of science denial in healthcare, we tend to think in terms of individual instances of irrational beliefs. Vaccines cause autism. Climate change is not real. A gun in the home makes you safer. All of these statements represent beliefs that many people hold despite evidence to the contrary. These beliefs can lead people to make decisions that are extremely dangerous for them and for those around them. News of measles outbreaks in Minnesota and the many firearm suicides that take place every day show us that this issue of disregarding the evidence is a real and urgent problem. This kind of attitude and these behaviors drives healthcare practitioners and public health professionals crazy. When we hear somebody say vaccines cause autism, we tend to want to shake the person and yell, that's not true, you're wrong, until they come over to our side. Believe me, I know, because I've wanted to shake a few people myself. And this has been our mode of response to these issues for years now. But this is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Meanwhile, public health professionals and healthcare practitioners are guilty of making all of the same mistakes everyone else does when it comes to following evidence-based practice. We prescribe antibiotics when they're not needed. We perform unnecessary medical procedures. And we ignore risks of health outbreaks and other crises until it's too late. So where are we going wrong? Our first mistake is that we tend to assume that all people need is more information and that the data alone will save the day. So we spend a lot of time and effort giving people the facts. Sometimes this works, but in many cases, it's not a simple lack of knowledge we're dealing with. Sometimes giving people the facts can even backfire and make them less likely to believe us. So what are we up against if it's not a simple knowledge gap? 
we're actually up against the fundamental ways in which human psychology conflicts with science. And there's one major way in which our natural psychological processes conflict with science. Science depends on updating constantly with new information, but our brains do everything they can to keep us from changing our minds. The psychology of sticking to your guns is so entrenched that we can even see it hardwired in the brain. Some imaging studies have shown that if you ask somebody to express a position they do not agree with, a part of their brain called the amygdala lights up. This is a part of the brain that's associated with fear, a very primitive fight or flight emotion. On the other hand, if you ask someone to express a position they do agree with, there's some evidence that this process involves a release of a neurotransmitter called dopamine, which is associated with the brain's reward centers. Going against your belief incites fear while sticking to your belief is actually rewarding. It feels good to stick to your guns. The same thing is true of group psychology. Going against the group induces the brain's fear centers, while sticking with the group stimulates the brain's reward centers. When you think about it, these findings make sense. There's no question that it's beneficial for us to be cooperative social beings. The health and survival benefits of being part of a group have been demonstrated extensively. The fact that our brains are wired to keep us in line with the group is actually adaptive. The same thing is true of sticking to your position or opinion. Indecisiveness is generally not rewarded. Under threatening conditions, it can even be risky. Once you've decided that something is dangerous, this allows you to make quick decisions in the face of real danger. The problem is that all of these things, changing your mind, going against the group, evaluating things independently, are central components of the scientific process. Without them, we can be led astray. We often hear of people losing faith in science because they read one day that coffee causes cancer and the next day that it cures it. What they're really responding to is the natural progression of science. We have a hypothesis, we test it, and we confirm it in one study. Then someone else comes along and can't replicate it. Then a third person comes along and replicates it, but in a different population, and on and on and on. The truths that we hold in public health and medicine are the result of many, many years of slow but steady inquiry. In the meantime, there can be a lot of internal contradiction. Meanwhile, people have to make health decisions, and we are primed to do so quickly and then resist changing our minds, even when new facts emerge. Once we read Andrew Wakefield's 1998 claim that vaccines cause autism, we're likely to disregard the 2003 retraction and subsequent debunking of that hypothesis, especially if we've also joined groups of other parents who agree with us. Let me now come back to where I started, the terrors of the ballet. Despite all of the reasons I had for not changing my mind, both psychological and neurochemical, I decided to give the ballet a try. At first, I did not say anything to my family. I, I was a little embarrassed. But after about four or five trips to the ballet over eight years, I finally said something to my mom, just casually. Her response was as expected. You? At the ballet? I said, yeah, I kind of don't mind it. At that moment, all of my worst fears did not come true. My mom was just happy that I was happy. And even though we both agree that it's still kind of funny that I, of all people, is going to the ballet, and even though I don't love it, we both recognize that my marriage had forced me to re-examine a belief that I once held firmly. That is a good thing. We can all be better about changing our minds. But how do we do this? The first step is to understand how and why you formed the belief in the first place. Then look at some of the barriers to changing your mind. And think about some of the benefits and drawbacks of holding on tight. Finally, you can introduce yourself to a new idea slowly at a pace that makes the change less threatening. In my ballet example, I actually followed these steps almost exactly. 
first, I went back to memories of my childhood to understand how and why I formed the belief that I hated the ballet. Then, I recognized that the barriers to changing my mind included the fact that my family, my tribe, agreed with me and the public nature of my position. Then I realized that the benefits of holding on to my viewpoint were reinforcement of the close connection with my tribe and the appearance of consistency to others. But the drawbacks included potential alienation of a new important person in my life and the possibility of missing out on something I might really enjoy. Finally, I introduced myself to the new idea slowly by going to one or two ballets over the next year and withholding a complete shift in judgment until after a few more experiences. I did not just wake up the next day, buy season tickets to the New York City Ballet, and post about my deep love of the, of the art form on Facebook. I introduced myself to the new idea at a pace that made the change less frightening. So what does this mean for us in healthcare? What do we do about such a deeply entrenched psychological phenomenon that causes people to make decisions that are extremely dangerous, like not vaccinating their children against highly contagious fatal illnesses? Well, for one thing, we need to stop yelling at people who don't agree with us. We also need to stop assuming they're stupid. They're not. Actually, we need to get rid of this us versus them mentality altogether. There is no us versus them. We're all prone to the misapplication of psychological processes that leave us stubbornly clinging to ideas that are wrong. We've all been horribly stubbornly wrong and will continue to be horribly stubbornly wrong about certain things for much of the rest of our lives. Our first step is to accept this, admit our mistakes, and stop trying to win. This isn't about winning. This is about working together to overcome the pitfalls of our own minds. Many people have told me that they fear there's an unwinnable battle being waged right now against facts, evidence, even the truth writ large. I don't see it that way. But I do see that if we want more people to accept the science on controversial issues, we need to approach this differently. It's not hopeless. And so the good news is that this field of friendly persuasion is helping people change their minds about the little things, like the ballet, but also about the big things that save people's lives. Thank you.